My name is George Galloway, presenter of Kali Mahorra on Al Mayadeen Television. Well, thank you. I don't mince my words. I speak Kali Mahorra, and my audience does too. Kali Mahorra, free word, free for me, free for you. Catch it. Nice to meet you, brother. Welcome to Kalimahara with me, George Galloway, on Al Maidin Television, coming to you from London, but discussing the worldwide sanctions on Russia, except they're not worldwide. We're asking the question, has the effect of economic sanctions on Russia been zero? As a matter of fact, less than zero. The ruble is the best performing currency in the world. The US dollar now below 70 with the Russian currency, the ruble. And here's some statistics from the horse's mouth from Guy Verhofstadt of the European Parliament, no less. While EU exports to Russia declined by 33% during the first seven months of 2022, amounting to 34.1 billion euros, EU imports from Russia surged by 69.9% up to 137.3 billion. According to the Central Bank of Russia, the most recent data shows Russia's external debt reached 434.1 billion compared with 469 billion in the previous quarter. So Russian external debt has gone down. Germany recorded the highest amount in its trade turnover with 20.7 billion euros worth of imports from Russia. But of all the countries listed, Slovenia was the country that topped all others in its imports of goods from Russia with a staggering increase of 346%, amounting to a total of 1.1 billion euros. I wonder if they sold any of them anywhere else. And while EU exports to Russia declined 33% during the first seven months, EU imports from Russia surged by almost 70%. So less than zero. They have backfired spectacularly in one of the most gigantic economic boomerangs ever seen. The war is going badly for the NATO countries on the battlefield and stretching out now across the general winter months to come. But on the economic front, it's going for the Europeans even worse. Europe is slumped economically and cold, shivering, freezing. Whole factories are being unscrewed from the floor in Germany and shipped to the United States because of the cost of energy. Green cards are being issued to German skilled workers to come and work and live in the United States. Germany is being de-industrialized. And Germany is, of course, the economic powerhouse of the EU. When Germany catches cold, the rest of the European Union catches influenza. And that's affecting even huge economies like the French. The British economy is most parlous of all. Although we're not in the EU, we can compare the likely slump in the British economy to others. And the Bank of England itself says that our recession will be worse than any other recession in the economically developed world. British workers are increasingly out on the cobblestones on strike because they will not accept the wage cuts because that's what an offer of a 3% wage increase actually is when inflation is in double digits. The workers are revolting. The British government 
is fluid. You could say it is rocky. The Prime Minister, I can't remember his name almost, it's Rishi Sunak. We've had three in the course of the last 12 months and we've had more finance ministers, foreign ministers and interior ministers than we used to joke about countries like Italy. How could anyone remember the names of their top officials? I'm afraid that's where Britain is now. Britain is the new Italy. So we'll leave aside the military reverses for the NATO armies over the last few months and concentrate on the economic. And we have, as always, a distinguished panel of experts and merely the enthusiastic amateur. Let's start with a Russian, with a man who was on both sides of the journalistic fence. He's a former BBC correspondent in Kiev and a former director and editor at Sputnik News Limited. His name is Nikolai Gorshkov. Nikolai, welcome back to the show. I asked, I believe I asked you, but I asked in an earlier show months ago on this, were the Western leaders fools or knaves? Did they know that the economic blowback of the decisions they were making would be as they've turned out to be, or did they know and didn't care? Well, probably they didn't know. And they didn't know because uh, they thought uh, historically that uh, the Russian people, uh, judging by their performance uh, under the Soviet eco uh, economic system, were not uh, exactly entrepreneurial, were not quick thinkers, but uh, the Russians, even under the Soviet system, were quite entrepreneurial and extremely quick thinkers because the Soviet economic system did not allow them to work properly, so to speak, in, in Western uh, terms. So they, they were quick th uh, thinking on their feet. Uh, and there's this famous saying by foreign visitors to Russia, to the Soviet Union, that whilst the shops were empty, the uh, kitchen tables and the dining room tables in Russia were full. How come? Well, because the Russians, they established a parallel system. And now they've established a parallel system as well. And probably that was not factored in. I can tell you about probably the biggest failure uh, in uh, the banking, uh, international banking system, uh, everybody would have thought that by uh, switching off uh, SWIFT from Russian banks and Russian payment uh, cards and systems would um, deal really a severe blow to the Russian financial system and especially uh, hurt uh, people in their pockets. But they didn't realize that the Russians were quick to learn from Hawala. You know, the system in the Arab world by way of which people are transferring money between each other by um, uh, a simple phone call or an SMS message. So I've got some money, uh, say uh, I'm in the West, I've got some money, but I need money in Moscow or the other way around. I just call somebody and I give the money to somebody locally and they give the money to a friend of theirs over there. And you wouldn't imagine uh, this now black market in money transfers between Russia and the rest of the world is huge. But this was, well, they would say that's an unintended consequence, but this is a huge consequence because basically, uh, with all this talk of Western financial institutions wanting to monitor and control the financial, um, um, the movements of, of huge amounts of money, they lost this opportunity with Russia because Russians are now uh, transferring this money uh, which could not be traced, really. Uh, that's, that's one thing. Another one is, of course, that um, the sanctions, especially on luxury goods, have failed dramatically. Why? There's now a rise of private buyer in Russia. If we hark back to the 1990s, when um, Russia was really in dire straits, uh, uh, consumer-wise, with consumer goods, uh, there was the so-called uh, shuttle traders, small-time traders who went to the West or China, brought in huge checkered bags, goods, and sold them on, on Russian uh, street markets. Now they're back, but uh, at a higher level. So you just call somebody in the States or in Britain or in France and order whatever you would like to, to order, and they will bring it privately to you using uh, third countries 
which uh, uh, are not taking part in, in the sanctions regime. So uh, basically, in these two areas at least, the Russians have managed to completely circumvent uh, Western restrictions. Extraordinary. Uh, Shabir Razvi, you are an economist as well as a political analyst, managing director at International Finance Solutions Associates. Isn't the problem here, as Nikolai just explained, that most people in the world, according to Newsweek's front page recently, 75% of the world are not with us on Ukraine. Isn't that the problem? That there are plenty of third countries, there are plenty of third peoples who don't support the sanctions against Russia and are now profiting from them. Thank you very much, George. A pleasure to be here. Look, um, what Nicola has described, sort of, you know, very important uh, evaluation of what's happening in, in Russia. But I think if you look at it in a broader context, in the broader economics, as you said, you know, the economic boomerang, uh, and I have always said that, you know, the nations that apply sanction on a third country that boomerangs on that nation itself because obviously they're not able to uh, uh, sell products, services and so on and get payment for it. And the classic example has been, if you like, Iran, you know, which has been sanctioned for the last 43 years, but it has survived, not only survived, but progressed. So on the situation of Russia is, of course, you know, this is a well-known fact now that the ruble it was the best performing currency in 2022. Uh, Russia has enormous amount of gold, uh, which they have been sort of piling on for the last 20 years. They're the biggest uh, buyers of gold exactly. at this moment. Uh, so uh, thirdly, uh, uh, Russia has come out with a very fascinating sort of uh, financial instrument of sort of trading in own currencies. Um, India is one of the big players with Russia, which is sort of trading in Indian rupees and rubles, if you like, and also barter. It's not just hawala, which is important, but the huge quantities of deals which are being made on a barter basis, which was, if you like, traditional economics when, uh, you know, whether Karl Marx or other economists historically have talked about that the speciality of one nation can be transferred to the other by barter deals you know if you've got ships to sell and you want to buy oil yes you'll sort of exchange that or rice to vice versa whatever other products and that has been a, a, a sort of interesting aspect of all what is happening but i think the illusion that we live in the west that when we talk about world order uh, the world is against xyz what that really means uh, george is america Canada, the European Union, Netoistan, if you like, uh, um, uh, Australia and Canada. The rest of the world... 13% of the yeah, world's population. So, you know, more than 75% of the world, African countries are not really abiding by, although they're relatively poor and they've been manipulated historically. And it's uh, with the election of Lulu in, 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 in Brazil, dynamics have changed there also. The geopolitical and the geoeconomic situation is moving so fast and rapidly uh, towards the east. You've got the uh, BRICS countries now, you've got the SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, you've got the Eurasian uh, complex, and then also the trade links that have started. I mean, you know, the railway line started from St. Petersburg all the way to Chabahar and from their shipment to India. That in itself is going to be a colossal uh, sort of movement of goods and services through that railroad. So I think it's not just boomerang. I think Mr. Orban, the Hungarian prime minister or president, quite rightly said that Europe has not only shot itself in the foot, but it's shot itself in the lungs. So that is more profound. Yeah, much than more. <laughs> you don't survive a shot in the yes. lungs so, uh, generally. So that's what has happened in reality, that if you look at it in the uh, sort of uh, uh, wider context, that we really, uh, not only have we been, uh, our leaders uh, particularly, have not only been stupid, but they haven't, you know, they, they lack wisdom. Wisdom. This well, is the biggest problem. This, I, I want to get to that point because I didn't before, because at that stage it was earlier in the conflict. We weren't quite sure. But Robert Shaw, you are a defense and security expert, but also an economic intelligence man. Uh, 
I come back to the question I asked Nikolai. Were our leaders fools or knaves? Were they too stupid to know that this would be the outcome? Or did they know this would be the outcome and are performing to some other agenda? Uh, well, George, um, first of all, I agree with some of the points made by uh, the two colleagues there. Um, there. Every country has, in a sense, an alternative economy system, a black market, if you will. Um, hence the Russian joke, you know, as long as the state pretends to pay me, I'll pretend to work. Uh, and that could be said of the NHS, etc. OK, so uh, every country that and there, again, there are more more economic organisations around the world. Globalisation is a benefit in that sense to everyone, which is why this regional war is affecting, in a sense, the whole globe. Um, but yes, Europe is one small part of that econo that global economic powerhouse. I wouldn't say that people could predict the future, certainly not economically. Good God, not every government in UK can do that every time. But, but um, with all you know, respect to you, I to did something. sitting in this chair. Uh, eight or nine months ago, I predicted exactly this. And if I can do it with no intelligence resources, uh, I, not even a university education, how come all these clever uh, people couldn't see it? Well, what I would say is, it, again, it's what's your, um, uh, what's your uh, definition of success? Um, they weren't trying to collapse Russia economically or anything like that. Uh, at the end of the day, they but they had to be seen to be doing something in principle against the invasion of Ukraine, another country. Um, and obviously, it doesn't involve NATO armies. NATO isn't at war with Russia, and NATO hasn't lost anything uh, militarily. It's the Ukrainian army that are fighting there. Um, but ultimately, they had to do something as a matter of principle. Um, and really, what they were after was to try and disrupt the military industrial base of Russia, which you can see the effects of. It has had some effects because Russia does run out of waves of missiles and has had to buy them from <laughs> Iran and That's China and places look, like that. It doesn't look that way to uh, I still me, find them, but they're not uh, Russian. I must say. Let's, let's uh, cross to Italy. Professor Marcello De Noli, he's from Bergamo, Professor Emeritus of Public Health and Epidemiology and the Sweden editor of the Indita magazine, uh, formerly a lecturer at Harvard Medical School and founder of the NGO Swedish Doctors for Human Rights. Professor, welcome to the show. Thank you for the invitation to participate in your show. Recently, one of the most important figures in the European Parliament conceded that the sanctions on Russia had not had the effect that they were intended to have. Is he right about that? Well, yes, uh, I think he is. And uh, there are several reasons for that, in my opinion. Now, historically, economic sanctions, embargoes, and the like, imposed to other countries, seldom they reach uh, their purpose. The primary objective of economic or financial sanction is, in fact, not economic, but instead obeys a political strategy. And this consists in trying to obtain a regime change or a political system change by fomenting dissatisfaction among the target population. Well, that was the primary intention behind the financial sanctions. What was the secondary intention? And a second reason is that even if the discourse of the United States and that of the European Union is of a hegemonic nature, there exists de facto a multipolar order in this world. This has made possible for Russia to find new partners, export and import wise, and consolidate new political alliances. There is a G7 and there is a G20, but there is also the BLIC, for instance. Is there any other reason behind the sanctions? Um, a third reason regarding Russia is that it has from start a solid economy and industry, and it is rich in natural resources, and it has a cutting edge technology as well. So this includes uh, its weapons manufacturing. So Western analysts that now say that sanctions against Russia will inexorably prevail in the long run, 
In a tweet, he said that after nine packages of sanctions, Russia was doing better than before, so less than zero impact. Was he right about that? Yeah, he he listed uh, geo countries, uh, which instead show an increased bilateral turnover, with the exception of Sweden, I believe, or Latvia, uh, Finland, uh, the Baltic countries in some. Well, the interesting issue in, in that classification uh, uh, put forward by, um, by uh, this uh, parliamentary uh, is that the countries he is mentioning uh, um, are characterized by historical uh, territorial disputes uh, with Russia. Um, all of those countries, including Sweden, Finland, etc. Uh, the anti-Russian sentiment is also higher in those countries, according to polls, is higher in those countries than in others in Europe, except perhaps um, Poland. Nevertheless, as I pointed before, sanctions have ultimately a political goal. And some countries in Europe have started to understand that the sanctions imposed to Russia at the initiative of the United States would very well be uh, a strategical move from the part of the United States to undermine the economies of those countries in Europe. And with that, at the end, making the American economy to prevail stronger than those of their their European um, competitors. I have already elaborated on that as early as March, um, April 2022, when I predicted that the economic sanctions would result in a boomerang for the European economies. What about the effect on Russian exports uh, of these sanctions? Has Russia not lost revenue from that? The Russian economy, the Russian currency, export, import indexes and other markets have got stronger. At the end of the day, we might find in Russian's counterparts in the United States, in the European Union, in NATO, etc., the West, in other words. We might find there are an exacerbated narcissism harbored in their powers elites. Their belief that their support to certain countries or vice versa, antagonism towards other nations would be essential for their survival respectively destruction of those nations. But they are wrong, nevertheless. Those elites, and I know them well, I may say, fail to understand the limitations of the hegemonic rule of the so-called West. Again, Russia has reinforced its economic ties, alliances, and friendship with several countries, such as in alphabetic order, if I am right, Argentina, uh, Brazil, China, Iran, Mexico, Saudi Arabia, South Africa, Venezuela, etc. Not to mention uh, the welcome in African and other Middle East countries that uh, Russia is experiences in these uh, times. Uh, Russian oil does not need to be sold predominantly to European countries. Russia has other strong markets to interact with, where to acquire pieces of technology for its further in industrialization demands, etc. Much more of this coming up after the break. Stay tuned.
you're watching Kalim Ahura with me, George Galloway, on Al Maidin Television, coming from London, but discussing the sanctions on Russia. Shabir, uh, the professor touched on just before the break one of the most interesting factors in this picture, which is that whilst the European economies are being scythed down by this rather sharp boomerang, the US economy is not. So the Russian economy is doing quite well. The American economy is not doing nearly as badly as the European economies are. Opening the question, are these European leaders willingly going into this dark uh, place uh, at the behest of the United States? And if so, why are there people not rising up against it? That is a fascinating question, and I have pondered over that uh, for the last uh, few years with the whole sort of uh, austerity measures that we've had, the decimation of uh, all kinds of industries. Why have not the people of France, Germany, Holland, United Kingdom, Spain, Italy haven't really come out on the streets. If you remember, uh, in Lebanon, just two years ago, when the government wanted to uh, put a charge on use of WhatsApp as, as a sort of, you know, uh, a, tax, a, a, yes. a tax, people came out in their tons, uh, hundreds and thousands for a small country like that. Uh, why we haven't? And I think uh, the answer could be that still people are believing the propaganda that is coming out of our mainstream media, uh, whether it's radio stations or broadcast media. That's one thing. Secondly, uh, people are still not possibly feeling the pain uh, that they would with a uh, cost of living crisis and as you mentioned in your opening with you know streets of London uh, uh, sort of uh, flush with uh, uh, strikers of all different uh, color uh, all different professions and so on um, so that I think is a very important question when will the people really rise up to the challenge they're facing I think the other thing is that of course, the American economy, in comparison to Europe, is doing, and you know, at the beginning um, last year, it's almost a year since the special operation started in Ukraine, uh, is that people were saying that this is a conspiracy theory that you know, uh, people, uh, America wants the European economy to be decimated, uh, and you know, the brain drain that is taking place, as you talked about, from Germany and other countries. Uh, now that's coming to true. You know, it's sort of no longer a conspiracy theory because in reality. It is happening. People are leaving. You know, uh, um, you know. Say, for example, uh, Portuguese nationals. They are moving to other Portuguese-speaking countries because there's a huge problems there. But I think what is important, as I said in my earlier comment, is that we are living in times when. You, we used to have G20 and uh, G7. Uh, now, what I like to call the V7 and the V20, the vulnerable seven nations of the world, if you like, and the vulnerable 20. Those economies are getting together, and you can name whichever countries you want in the uh, V7, if you like. Could be Russia, China, Iran, India, South Africa, Brazil, and so on, and, and Venezuela. Uh, these could be the V7 of the future, and they will be the driving force. All economists, all analysts, all sort of uh, 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 fair-minded, unbiased, academics are saying that the economy is moving to the east. Let's so it's go to Moscow, in fact, to Russia, to Mark Sleboda, who is an American living in Russia. He's a security analyst, senior lecturer, and a former nuclear reactor operator at the United States Navy. How is that for a CV? Mark, welcome. Thanks for having me, George. It's always an honor and a pleasure to be on the show. Mark, you're an American expat living in Russia. Do you agree with the statements made recently by senior figures in the European Parliament that the impact on Russia of EU sanctions has been less than zero? Yeah, I, I would say that that is a, an exaggeration to say that the effects of sanctions is less than zero. Of course, uh, Russia and the uh, EU as a whole, uh, and and to a lesser extent, the United States were major trade partners. 
Uh, that trade has largely ground to a halt uh, with, with very few exceptions remaining at this point. So to say that the effects are less than zero is simply false. Uh, it, to say that the effects did not have the desired result is absolutely correct. Um, because quite obviously, uh, Russia has not changed its foreign policy. Uh, it has not ended its intervention uh, in the Ukrainian civil conflict. Um, and if we were to compare the effects of Western sanctions, particularly European sanctions on Russia, with the blowback from those sanctions on European countries, I do believe it would be largely accurate to say that Western sanctions, particularly European sanctions, have had a worse effect in relative terms on their own economies than they have had on Russia. But what about within Russia itself? What has been the effect on the Russian population? Um, right now, uh, after a year of these sanctions, um, for the vast majority of, of uh, Russians, life largely goes on as before. Uh, there has been uh, close to an 11 percent inflation rate over the year, but that is less than in many parts of the eurozone. Uh, so, again, everything has to be kept in in relative terms. There are many EU countries that were primary trade partners with Russia where the inflation rate is uh, uh, it, ab above 20 percent. So um, quite obviously, they are suffering higher uh, as a result. Uh, we all know that energy prices are growing through the roof in Europe, um, whereas in Russia, of course, as an energy provider, that is, is not the problem. And there has been no shortage of alternate customers for that energy because the rest of the world outside of the West has refused to participate in this existential economic war on Russia. So all of the energy, the reliable, relatively cheap and stable supply of energy that had been going to Europe is now going in ever greater terms to China, to India, even to Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia and India are both buying Russian energy in large quantities and then reselling it to Europe at a markup. <laughs> uh, so at the end result, their Europeans are actually using Russian energy because it is a finite commodity. There's limited supplies of it in the world. Um, and um, it, it's a war of commodities versus capital. And in that battle, commodities are winning. The com Russia's commodities, uh, oil, gas, grain, sunflower oil, metals, all of these vital things were drastically underappreciated uh, how important they had become over the last 30 years to global market. According to the Russian Central Bank, there has been actually a slight decrease in uh, Russia's uh, foreign indebtedness. Does that mean then that Russia is better off than before the war? Yeah, again, relative terms. Um, so obviously, Russia does not have a debt economy like European countries in the U.S. do, right? Russia started out this conflict with very large foreign exchange currency reserves, some $643 billion worth of reserves. Compare that to, say, the U.S. with $32 trillion worth of debt, right? Uh, and uh, uh, the U.K., uh, European countries, very similar obviously somewhat lesser numbers there. Um, at the start of the conflict, of course, the, uh, the West has seized Russian foreign exchange reserves in their currencies, right? That was in their country. And that was about half of Russia's foreign exchange reserves that were seized. That was extremely significant. And quite obviously, I don't think the West ever intends to return those funds. They're right now manufacturing laws to just allow them to steal. Right. Russia already assumes that. But over the course of this conflict, because of the disruption of 
uh, the global distribution routes, particularly again for energy, for oil and gas, that has pushed the price of these commodities much higher, which means that even with selling slightly smaller volumes of energy, Russia was reaping huge returns on that energy. That has allowed them in the course of a war, of a major conflict against essentially all of NATO to save money all during this period because the Kremlin is flush with cash. Um, they have been able to build up those foreign exchange reserves back up to 580 billion by the end of December, just below what they were when the West stole half of them last year. That is phenomenal. The big difference now is instead of large portion of that foreign exchange reserves being in the dollars and the euro supporting those economies, none of it is now, and all of it is in the yuan and in gold. Well, based on what you're saying and what these European parliamentarians are conceding, uh, the uh, sanctions must represent a huge miscalculation. Why would they make such a miscalculation, all these uh, clever people? Or are they being driven into these calculations by U.S. Yeah. interests? Yeah. So um, I think, uh, first of all, there has been a huge miscalculation. I think that the Western governments, the U.S. and the EU, have both gotten extremely bad economic advice from their economic experts. There has been a tendency to vastly overvalue the importance of the service um, and luxury item uh, and tourism intensive European economies and to downplay the importance of commodities uh, th that actually are very technical, uh, very high tech uh, extraction of oil and gas. These are actually some of the most technologically advanced industries in the world. And they've been really downplayed the importance of them. And, and we've seen that out. You, you try to excise probably the biggest global commodity supplier overall in terms of oil, gas, grain, metal, so much out of the global markets. And that has hurt more the countries that had established um, uh, trade ties to to uh, access uh, those commodities, meaning Europe primarily. Nikolai, uh, as you listen to that, you begin to get a sense of the scale of the miscalculation that uh, Mark referred to. The question that's begged for me is, is this permanent? Uh, w the war in Ukraine will be over one day. All wars come to an end. Uh, whether it's in this year or next. It'll be over one day. What happens then? Do these sanctions get lifted? Does Russia begin to look back to the West for markets? Or is this rupture a permanent one and therefore a kind of new Berlin Wall or Iron Curtain? Well, it depends on uh, whom you're listening to. Uh, probably it's not very well known in the, in the outside world, but... Uh, the kind of the Russian opposition, uh, the countries along the perimeter of Russia, the former Soviet republics, especially in the Baltics, also Poland, they've been discussing in earnest the breakup of Russia because they are certain, at least these people who are now, they, they, they're gathering together either in Vilnius in Lithuania or in Latvia or elsewhere. There's lots of conferences right now going on and online conferences as well discussing after they win, because they're certain, they believe that Can they would, they really be? They, uh, when they defeat Russia, which is a given to them, uh, into how many pieces, bits and pieces, are they, uh, would they be happy to divide Russia? There are plans, there are maps, you can Google them. It's like 89 pieces of Russia, or so uh, where the Russians would be, the kind of ethnic Russians, although there's no such thing as ethnic Russian. A Russian is somebody just like an American. A Russian is somebody living in Russia. They might not necessarily be ethnically Russian, yes, but uh, they speak Russian, so they're Russian. So, yes, there is this uh, uh, strata of uh, Western or 
pro-Western society which believes that Russia is going to lose dismally and it has to be dismembered. Uh, now, on the other side of the spectrum, in Russia, uh, more and more people are saying we would never ever believe the West again. So it could be a rupture. Uh, how long uh, the war, the, this special operation take place, we don't know. Uh, actually, there's a reason for the Russians to call it a special operation as opposed to a war, because uh, you might not know, but uh, Ukraine is still pumping Russian gas to Western Europe and getting paid in the process. The Gazprom is still pumping gas via Ukraine. So, you know, in an all-out war, this would have been impossible. They're still doing business together, Russia and Ukraine, on gas. And everybody's earning. Ukraine is getting transit fees, Russia is getting uh, money for the gas, and Western Europe is using Russian gas. So, uh, one way or another, both sides would have to find an equilibrium after this ends. Uh, but then, uh, the question here is that, say, uh, and I've been saying this all along, this, uh, the old Europe, you know, the, the, core, the core of the European Union, France, Germany, the Netherlands, Italy, and the new Europe, uh, the former East European um, uh, kind of satellites of the Soviet Union, the East, the East Europeans have hijacked, basically, the European agenda. Uh, what is the sort of the, the grand maybe they're not, not going to be grands anymore, you know, the, the, the bigger European countries. They are now meekly following the, uh, the agenda of those smaller countries along the perimeter of the former Soviet Union who can't still get over their uh, uh, historic experiences. They're still, I think, and talking to people in those countries, they're still full of kind of, you know, f desire uh, for revenge you know, getting one over the Russians. Robert, uh, I'm right that all wars end sometime. Mm -hmm. It's difficult at this moment to see the ending of this one. Uh, it's frankly impossible for me to see the outcome that Nikolai says these yapping uh, little republics uh, on the edge of Russia have in mind, a Russian defeat, a breakup of Russia, Let's assume for argument's sake that Ukraine is partitioned, perhaps along the Dnipro, perhaps including also the southern coastline, leaving Western Ukraine uh, a rump state, landlocked and so on. Does, do we settle in then for 43 years of sanctions like we have against uh, Iran? Uh, or does somebody come along and say, let's reset this relationship? Well, it's a possibility, as proven by Iran, still being under sanctions 43 years later. Um, one can't turn that debt completely down. Um, however, uh, and again, I agree with the colleague, a lot of uh, ex eastern European states, uh, well, culturally, people have long memories. Hence the Polish joke, you know, who'd you kill first, the Russian or the German? The German because it's business before pleasure. At the end of the day, they all have long memories of being occupied by the Soviet army and abused by the KGB during the Cold War. So ultimately, I wouldn't go so far as to say they want revenge. What I would say, they're very conscious of that, which is near history, let's be fair, and it's going to stay around for a while. However, I do believe that, you know, as you said, all wars come to an end and there has to be a political deal struck. Um, and that is up to the politicians to do. Um, I think that Ukraine, uh, well, whether it would be happy in Russia occupying that part of, um, you know, its former terrain, uh, east of the river, um, that will be up for something to Ukrainians to decide. Uh, and that will be at that moment in time when that conflict ends. Um, economic uh, investment in post-war countries has worked like the Marshall Plan after the Second World War. Um, so it's in everyone's political interest to invest you know, and move on, uh, invest economically and get, as you say, reset the clock and get back. But it is difficult. Human terrain is very complex and people have long cultural memories. So it's whether that will provide enough of a barrier. I don't think it will. Money talks. And as you said, trade always goes on. You know, uh, Russia has a lot of natural resources to sell, oil and gas, and has been doing so. Yes, to non-traditional customers, you might say, has had to move markets, Although China, Iran, and so on. often ends up back with the traditional agreed, customer with, uh, agreed, a, with uh, a markup. You know, and again, you know, point made, you know, in both world wars, all countries that are at war still traded. 
They might have done it through a third country, but they all needed something from each other to be able to continue the war that they were in. So it's nothing new in that sense. That will continue to happen throughout all wars in the future. Shabil, um, the, no, you'll way. not be surprised that the phrase from Mark Sloboda that uh, gladdened my heart most was that this is a war between capital and commodities and commodities are winning. Uh, I could have told them that, but uh, that's what's happening. Just as you mentioned earlier, the, the strikers uh, on the streets of London, didn't we discover during the pandemic the value of certain things and certain workers that were overlooked before? So a truck driver is actually much more important than someone sitting at a computer screen uh, operating derivatives and hedge funds. Uh, ditto uh, the, the workers in the hospital when your husband is uh, rushed in uh, in a trolley. So on the big level, things like coal and steel and oil and gas and gold and silver and metallics and uh, all the rare earth minerals and all these commodities of which Russia is the world's biggest treasure trove are much more important than having a lot of dollars in the bank, uh, especially as these dollars are not really backed up by anything. This is therefore a historic shift, isn't it? It is indeed a historic shift, and I think uh, the, our friend from uh, Moscow, the battle between commodities and capital, I did pick that up, and I think that's where we are, that the capital that has been circulating in Europe and America is not worth the loo paper, if you like, you know, you just print it as much as you like. Hence, uh, from an economic point of view, that financialization of business, if you like, if you're making widgets, uh, 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 George, you can sell widgets, but how many uh, cappuccinos can you sell? How many sort of, I mean, what I call my industry, I'm, I'm, I'm a financial advisor, my day job is, uh, certain industries in Europe and America, what I call parasitic industries, uh, financial services, banking, lawyers, consultants, what do they produce in reality? You might say that, okay, they have knowledge, they've been to study and so on, but it's not a real contribution in real terms. If someone is selling uh, a, 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 an ounce of gold or, or coal or any other commodity, that is required to run the industry. That is uh, required uh, for people to have food on their table. Uh, so, so commodities absolutely are very, very important. And I think the dominance of commodities, that's why countries in South America, Africa, and Far East, because they have commodities to sell to the world and they need it. And the Middle East, of course, you know, the, uh, if you like, the engine of oil uh, uh, that is available. That's another commodity. So long as uh, the financialization of the global economy moves away from that, uh, then it becomes more stable, if you like, then there is more sort of uh, effort to come out with uh, so that nations can work together. And here I'd just like to remind uh, yourself and our audience, and I'm sure you remember, recently um, uh, when the uh, foreign minister of Germany said that, I don't care at all about my voters, I'm going to do whatever I want to. So the reality is that the elite in Europe are not really worried about their uh, people in the street. They are uh, hubristic, they are arrogant, they are condescending on anyone other than uh, you know, European way of thinking. All that is solid has melted into air in Western societies, and all that is sacred has been profaned. This has been Kali Mahora. I've been George Galloway, and you have been a marvellous audience. Thank you for watching.